Production support for the weekly special is provided by Smithville, a local provider of fiber optic based internet, TV, and phone services. Smithville's quantum fiber optic network allows large amounts of data to travel around the world from local homes and businesses. More at smithville.net. Siam House, offering Thai fine dining and takeout, including stir fries, curry dishes, and banana fritters as featured in Bon Appetit. Lunch buffet, 11 to 3 p.m. weekdays, corner of 4th and Dunn. IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. publichealth.indiana.edu. And WTIU members, thank you. It's getting chilly out there, but we've got stories that are guaranteed to warm your heart. That's right, it's gonna be a lot of fun tonight. From the delectable treats at the world's largest chocolate store, the astonishing Hall of Heroes Museum and the cultural impact of comic books. Plus the smooth funk of nationally renowned band, The Main Squeeze. Stay tuned, it's all coming up right here on the weekly special. Welcome to another great evening with the weekly special. I'm Daryl Neer. And I'm Erica Sagon. Well, Daryl, fall officially arrived, I think, about three weeks ago. But for me, it didn't really feel like fall until just this week. You know, the, the leaves changing, the cool morning air, it, it's been wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that one of my favorite ways to enjoy the cooler weather is with a nice cup of hot cocoa. And up next, we'll show you the perfect place to go for that. It's part of our brand new series, Midwest Made, where we explore the surprising goods produced right here in Indiana. For most kids across the country, the dream of walking into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory remains a childhood fantasy. But for the kids of South Bend, it's more than a fantasy. It's a brisk trip downtown to the world's largest chocolate store. Over 10,000 square feet of pure delight, founded by chocolate maker, Mark Tarner. My dad was a chocolate maker, so I grew up from the time I was about 10 is the first time I went in and made chocolate. And I was just a natural at working for my father. He had a position available, and I started the company at 29. But since I grew up in the business, you know, I had almost a lifetime of experience with my father. A lot of the recipes were still his, not all of them. She was an incredible fudge maker, and no one had done a licensed chocolate before. And I started three items, the Domer, the Rockney, and Nuts for ND, and we still make it and that was kind of the kernel of the idea. I was doing things a little bit differently, and we're still doing that. Today, the company is the fastest growing chocolate company in the country. At the South Bend factory, employees work around the clock producing over 500 different candy products and an average of over 10,000 pounds of chocolate a day. We make uh, probably the, one of the widest range of products in the industry today. We make everything from double dip peanuts and malted milk balls, to turtles, caramels, toffee. We have 11 different types of caramel corn. We roast probably 40 to 50 different types of coffees. We're likely the largest roaster in the state of Indiana in coffee, and it's not even what we do. Everything begins with the first step, and I was a manufacturer, but I needed to build a brand. So I like to control as much of the manufacturing process as humanly possible. I took chocolate and put it in a vertical bag. It may sound like a small thing, but when I started 20 years ago, no one did it. And I told all my fellow Hoosiers that I'm Indiana's chocolate company. You know, like all business people, you know, you either play the hand you're dealt or you decide that you're gonna make up the rules of the game yourself. And so I started doing things differently. I combined the old candy store that had been around for 150 years wasn't good enough for me. I added food, wine, coffee. It's, it's likely the world's largest chocolate shop. It's not really a chocolate shop. There's so many bells and whistles to it, but it's 10,000 square feet. And I don't think there's another one even close. For Mark, the company has given him the opportunity to spread his community's goodwill across the country, not just in name, but also in locally sourced ingredients. 
sometimes because we live in the Rust Belt, Hoosiers have a tendency to discount the great things that we produce. I'm very proud of where I'm from, and we concentrate on buying good ingredients, buying the best chocolate. I buy all my products as locally as I can. It makes sense logistically, it makes sense financially, and it makes sense if you help build your neighbor's future that they'll, they'll be loyal and, and buy your product. We want to see our community, and particularly South Bend, succeed. And then outside of the state of Indiana, they don't think of U.S. Steel or uh, Eli Lilly. They think of this company that's named South Bend that's in Indiana, you know, because it allows us to extend our community nationwide. I think we're probably ahead of the curve on that one, too. Hopefully we stay ahead of the curve. Well, Daryl, I grew up in South Bend and I grew up on this chocolate and so I know it's delicious, but we should probably try some just to make sure they've still got it, right? You, you know that moment where you pick up a piece of chocolate and you wonder what's inside? <laughs> I really enjoy that moment, so let's go. All right. That's good. They've still got it. <laughs> and if you'd like to try some South Bend chocolate for yourself, you can find the nearest location by visiting their website, sbchocolate.com. Well, while some kids dream of visiting Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, others dream of being a superhero. But for one Indiana resident, that love for all things heroic has turned into a lifelong venture that's simply out of this world. As a kid, everybody has a passion for something. And for me, it was comics and superheroes. It was just, I never outgrew it. Now, as I got older, I actually became a professional writer, and Holly Heroes actually started out as a publishing company back in the 90s. About a half a dozen of the guys that worked for me and trained with me are now working for Marvel in DC. And all that time, of course, I was collecting. The museum idea came about that my old building where half my office was real estate offices, and then the other half was just kind of my stuff in storage, semi on display. And a lot of my clients would, you know, hey, what's in there? You know, and they see the door in between, and they'd want to see it, and people really loved it. And just a lot of people said, you know, this would be a really cool museum. There isn't anything like this. 90% of the museum's collections is my personal collection from 35 years. We have over 10,000 toys and props and memorabilia items. We have over 100 pieces of original art, which is original comic book pages, or animation cells from the old cartoons. We have over 55,000 and growing comic books, which is every comic book from 1956 to present. It has grown tremendously. You know, the books, we're adding at least 40 new comics every week. Right now, we're working on the years 1954 to 1956, working our way back, all the way back to 1938, Superman's first appearance. We are the only organization trying to acquire and preserve every original comic book, hard copies. There are organizations doing this digitally, but we're the only ones actually doing the historical preservation, the original hard copies. When comic books first came out in 1935, they were pretty much reprints of the newspaper strips. The first superhero, well, of course, was Superman in 1938, so that's when the whole superhero craze started. Batman a year later in 1939, and then about 1940, you've got all of these characters. Then you enter World War II, now the comic books change. You know, the comic books are propaganda now for the war effort, and they're one of the largest propaganda sources. During World War II, soldiers were the number one reads of comic books. They were a main part of their care packages. Captain America, he symbolized patriotism, what they were fighting for. Wonder Woman symbolized who they were fighting to survive to get back home to, their wives, their girlfriends, whoever that strong female influence was. So that's kind of why those two are the most popular. Kids were made to feel like they were contributing to the war effort by donating their comic books for the scrap paper drives, their tin toys to the scrap metal drives, which was the origins of what we now know as recycling. Just an example, I actually dress up as Captain America because I'm also a Boy Scout leader. So when we do our Memorial Day parade with my scouts, I've dressed up as Captain America the last several years. The first time we did that, we were worried about kids running out in the parade route because a superhero was out there. Didn't happen that way. It was 80-year-old men. They had to stop the parade route three times because World War II veterans were coming out the one to shake my hand or pose for pictures with Captain America. So comic books did play an important role in those things. That's why what we're doing here to preserve not only the comics but the toys, it's history and nobody else is doing it. We've had people here from 10 to 80 and because that's what we do here is we have a museum set up as basically a time machine, which is the coolest time machine. It's a time machine that looks like the Hall of Justice. So we get people in their 80s 
They come out here, they remember the World War II stuff. They remember Captain America. They remember Captain Marvel. They remember the old Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. It really makes people feel young again, and I like being able to give that to people. Okay, Erica, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a superhero. Uh -huh. If you could choose your superpowers, what would it be? Um, okay, well, I'd, I'd like to fly, uh, maybe a little time travel, and I'm not sure if this is technically a superpower, but I'd love to have a lovely singing voice. <laughs> I'm not sure that counts, but we'll give it to you anyway, all right? You've got to check out the museum's event of the year, the Hall of Villains Haunted House. It's taking place this weekend and the next. Get out there and meet the scariest villains of the superhero world. You can learn more at hallofheroesmuseum.com. And for those that want to learn more about the cultural impact of comics, PBS will premiere the first documentary miniseries to examine the history of the comic book genre. It will be airing on most stations next Tuesday, October 15th at 8 p.m., but check your local listings to be sure you don't want to miss it. And speaking of historical significance, we are joined by artist Nate Powell. He recently co-wrote the first graphic novel in a trilogy about Congressman John Lewis's life as a civil rights leader. And we're so excited to speak with you today. Thanks for being here, Nate. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Nate, could you just give a brief uh, description of what a graphic novel is? Yeah, essentially it's just a novel-length comic book. Uh, it's not strictly a novel because a lot are non-fictional, but... Uh, at its most basic level, a comic with a spine. That's all you need to know. <laughs> How did you arrive to, to get such a rich topic such as Congressman Lewis's life? He's such an iconic figure in the civil rights movement. Uh, I was hard at work on some other books, and I saw a press release that my publisher had signed a deal to do March without an artist. I sort of took note of it, but a couple weeks later, my publisher gave me a call and suggested that I try out for the position. So I did some demo pages based on the script, and I sent them off to the congressman and the co-writer, Andrew, and we just kind of, you know, built up a relationship from there and decided it was the thing to do. And how about the relationship between you and the congressman? How did you negotiate that? Because, I mean, such, again, such a strong figure with a, a, a strong story. Um, I guess when I was going into it, I sort of had to build what relationship I could by reading his memoir and meeting him every few months whenever I could or if I was visiting D.C. or visiting Alabama. Um, since the completion of book one, now that I'm working on book two, we've been hanging out pretty much every weekend for the last four months or so, mm. doing a variety of signings sure. and presentations. We've become you know, genuine friends, um, which is, has been a very enriching experience, but it's also sort of changed uh, and enriched my experience of converting books two and three in the trilogy to paper. Well, I want to back up and, and talk about how, how did you get interested in comic book art to, to begin with. It, it, it's such a fascinating avenue to go. Uh, well, basically, you know, I'd been reading comics since I was three or four, and I had been drawing since I was three or four, but I never really put the two together until uh, my best friend in about 1990, who had been drawing for a couple of years, just suggested, he's like, oh, well, we obviously need to draw comics together. I was like, oh, why didn't I think of that? And really, it's just no turning back from that point. And a couple of years later, uh, we self-published our, our first comic. And, and the, you've, you've gone on to publish a number of, of graphic novels that are, are, have such a strong social justice tone. Could you talk about where that came from, just br briefly? Um, one thing I like to say is that, you know, I'm a human being, and so it seems very natural to me that I'm interested in human rights and justice and equality. But in a more specific sense, I guess, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an Arkansan, and I grew up throughout the South. Um, but it really took, I don't know, getting involved with the punk rock subculture and a lot of the politics and ethics that go along with it uh, you know, deeply informed and influenced me as an adolescent, as an adult, continues to. But I'd say in terms of my comics output, it took until my late 20s before I, I really felt like I was able to move past uh, some of the anxieties and hang-ups of uh, coming from a places like a middle-class white southerner um, and being able to you know, have a meaningful dialogue about race, violence, justice, and power, uh, particularly in mid-America. Well, Nate, I, I appreciate you giving us that, that background and overview of March and, and you coming into the, 
weekly special. It's, it's great. Yes, thanks, Nate. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, and we are going to have Nate stick around for an extended interview that you can watch on our website, so be sure to check that out. But if you'd like to learn more about March Book One, visit TopShelfComics.com. Thanks again, Nate. It was so great to have you here. Glad to be here. And we are so excited to introduce our next musical guests. They are known for their diversity, their talent, but most of all, their energy. The five of us come from five different backgrounds and five different musical influences. We all bring those influences to the table. That kind of gets thrown in this pot and gets mixed together and together it becomes the main squeeze. Throughout the last three, four years, we've been figuring out how we can take each individual person and the sound that they bring and make it into one sound, because that's the ultimate goal, is to come up with one sound that we all are proud of and we all can like call our own. When we first got together, we learned the common spot was Bloomington. So we've built it here from the ground up. It's funny, like sitting in a bar where there's been 30, 40 people that were at our first show listening to us play you know, one original song. And we got accepted to be in the top 12 bands, to get flown out to China to compete in this Battle of the Bands. It went great. We won first place, and uh, that's what's happening this year. We got invited back as the special guest winners from 2012. We started as a live band. Like, we had been playing live in front of a bunch of people before we ever entered a studio for the first time. I'm working on new music with um, being produced by Randy Jackson. It's been a new thing for us as far as just getting new music out to these folks too. So we've been able to kind of play with some of the newer tunes live and work on those and get ready to take them back to the studio so we can produce a, a really good album that we can all be proud about. We really try to each have an influence on the sound that it is and we, we do call it feel good music because it's good for the soul. If, you know, for a couple hours if you can just kind of enjoy what's going on. and We enjoy hearing each other and we like to bring out the best of each other as well. And I think that that's something that the audience really captures and they really t take hold of that too. It's like, you guys are always having so much fun and it, it, it's fun for us. It's we, real, we, yeah. we, we enjoy it. It's like, oh, I can't believe you played that. Or, oh, you know, and it's been really nice um, in the sense of just being able to connect with a new fan base. Every show, regardless of if it's for 10 people or hundreds or thousands, like our goal is to make a difference in every person that's at the show's like life, whether it be a minute where they just like think to themselves, wow, like I am just having like the best time of my life right now. That's all like we were set to do. Like that's what we wanted to do from the start and it's been awesome to see it grow and since like we have been traveling around the country and around the world to China, um, it's like it means so much to us that we're able to spread it to so many different people from all over. Well, as you can see, they aren't in the studio with us this evening, but they have a good excuse. That's right. They're actually in China as we speak, hosting the competition that they won last year. So we had the opportunity to bring them in before they left. Enjoy the main squeeze. you matter when no one else cares about you. A love that's forever and true. Oh, you need to love yourself somebody. Love yourself somebody. Love yourself somebody. Oh, love yourself somebody the way that I do.
Again, that was the main squeeze, and it's so great to see them getting some well-deserved recognition beyond Bloomington. And for the latest information on their national tour dates, visit their website, mainsqueezemusic.com. And remember that you'll have to go to our website for their full performances, plus the incredible extended interview with Nate Powell. And you really do need to check out the interview with Nate Powell because he provides some great information about March. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, once again, the main squeeze. Everything 
Production support for the weekly special is provided by Smithville, a local provider of fiber optic based internet, TV, and phone services. Smithville's quantum fiber optic network allows large amounts of data to travel around the world from local homes and businesses. More at smithville.net. Siam House, offering Thai fine dining and takeout, including stir fries, curry dishes, and banana fritters as featured in Bon Appetit. Lunch buffet, 11 to 3 p.m. weekdays, corner of 4th and Dunn. IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. publichealth.indiana.edu. And WTIU members, thank you.